This video was sponsored by Suizan Saws. Oh, hey, I'm in my office space that I'm working on building right now. Don't worry, you'll see more of the entire space later. But for right now, I wanted to show you this decorative casing that I just installed on the lower half of the wall. Decorative casing is a great way to really jazz up and fancify a space. It's not that hard to install. I did all of this in a day, well, not painted. I got it installed in a day. You'll see in the video. So watch, see how I did it. Do some decorative casing of your own. Check out the video description for links to all the products I used and a link to our Patreon page. And make sure you subscribe if you want to. Down there. Okay, let's roll the video. Now I know you just saw this space in my last video building the giant built-in with Keith Johnson, but here it is again, my future office space. Right now, it's still kind of a blank canvas. It's got these huge walls, 17 feet up to the top of the top plate, and that's before it starts to slope for the ceiling. So yeah, it's a big space. And because it's a big space, I wanted to break up that wall with a little bit of a decorative detailing, casing, chair rail, wainscoting, whatever you want to call it. And of course, I didn't want to buy some stock beadboard at the store. I wanted to build it myself. So here we go. The first thing I knew I needed to do was trim out the doors. No matter what kind of trim you're doing in your house, you always want to do the doors first because the door trim comes all the way down to the floor and you can tie the rest of the trim into that. Now I had this custom steel door put in and they kind of had to install it in a weird way where it's bolted right onto the door frame. So the edge of the door isn't flush with the drywall, it's actually flush with the two x four door jam. So before I just trim out the door, I needed to cut away some of the drywall exposing the entire jam so that I could put an initial piece of trim down that would be flush with the metal door jam and then I'll kind of stair step up to the actual door trim. So I got out the multi-tool and well, I made a terrible mess because drywall is nasty. Luckily I was wearing that RZ mask, love those things. Yes, there's a link in the video description. Now, I didn't have to be very careful or even remove that much drywall because you're not gonna see the majority of this trim. You're just gonna see a little bit peeking out as it stair steps down from the actual door trim. So I just ripped down some pieces of half inch MDF I had laying around and I stuck them in there, just barely overhanging that steel frame and I tacked them in place with a 16 gauge brad nailer. And as you can see when I open up the door here, now that trim piece is flush with the drywall and just barely overhangs the steel door jam. So this will give me the perfect surface to actually mount my final door trim on. I just needed to throw one more piece at the top. And because this is gonna be pretty much all covered up, I didn't take the time to miter my joints. I just slapped a piece in there and tacked it in place. Now all of my wall trim is gonna be three quarters of an inch thick, which means that my door trim needs to be thicker than that so that it sits proud of the rest of my trim. So I got some pre-primed MDF pieces that were a true one inch thick by about four inches wide. Now whenever I'm doing door trim like this, I like to cut all my pieces and assemble them not on the door frame because I like to glue all those mitered joints and it's much easier to get them glued and nice and tight when you're working on the floor and not trying to do it around the door. So I grabbed a piece of cardboard so I wouldn't get glue all over my fresh new oak floors. And then I used a combination of CA glue and just regular wood glue. The wood glue is what's really gonna hold those two MDF pieces together and the CA glue is gonna act as a clamp because it'll bond instantly and then I don't have to sit around and wait for that wood glue to dry. So I just put a few dabs of the CA glue on either end of that wood glue, added some accelerator spray to my other piece, and I squished the two pieces together and waited and waited until it was all dry. 
Then I just repeated that exact same process on my other corner. And when it was all glued up, I very carefully carried the entire piece over and stuck it around my door. By gluing these pieces up separately and then sticking it around the door, it also makes it much easier to get a nice even reveal on the top and on the sides because you can move the entire thing back and forth a little bit to make sure everything's exactly where you want it. Then I just tacked that to the wall again with some 16 gauge brad nails. Yes, of course, I'll come cover these up later. And finally, it was time to do my other door. Now the other door was just a typical door jam, so the jam came out flush with the drywall. So all I had to do was just that one layer of trim over the top. I glued it up in my shop this time, carried it out, got it all positioned exactly where I wanted it, and tacked that in place as well. And we were good to go with the door trim and ready to move on to our decorative casing. Now for the decorative casing, we're gonna do a simple board and batten pattern. So first we need some floor molding. And for that, I decided to go big because it's a really big space. So I got this one by 12 MDF pre-primed. And what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna take this rabbiting bit and I'm gonna add a quarter inch groove to the top of all of my trim pieces. This is gonna give me the perfect lip to set down in a quarter inch panel of MDF so that my seam is perfect and there's no gaps. I just hate routing MDF because it makes a horrible mess. But as you can see, I've got this nice little rabbited lip that I can slide that quarter inch MDF panel down behind. If that doesn't make any sense, well, don't worry. I'm gonna show you the entire process, so just hang tight. Next, I'm just gonna trim out the entire room like I would do with any normal baseboard. The only difference is that we'll be building off of that baseboard to do our decorative board and batten casing. All the trim pieces came in 16 foot runs and unfortunately, I can't cut those very well on my normal miter saw setup. So I had to pull out my contractor saw. This also worked out well because the blade is bigger on my contractor saw, so it was easier to do mitered cuts all the way across with the sliding miter saw. So I cut miters for all of my corners, measured out my pieces, and then carried everything back over to the shop and started putting baseboard into place. Now, some of you might paint your baseboard before you install it. This is pretty common to paint it all, install it, and then just go back and touch up your nail holes. But my painter prefers that I install all the baseboard and trim, and then he'll come tape off the floor and just spray everything. I personally think this is a much cleaner look because everything is perfect and you don't have brush strokes and you can get everything filled and caulked and all that. And once you're satisfied with the way it looks, well, the painter comes in and makes it beautiful. The real nice thing about installing this before the wall was painted is that I could see through the texture and know exactly where all my studs were because it was the lines that they mudded for the drywall. But I was still missing the studs a few times, so I decided to pull out the stud finder just to double check that I was right in the center of those studs so I didn't blow a nail through on the left or right of a stud. And with that, I had my first piece of trim in. Then all I had to do was just work my way around the room, making sure to cut miters on all my corners so all the seams came together quite nicely. And before long, it was starting to, well, look like some big old baseboard in a giant room. But don't worry, it'll, it'll all come together. Just patience. Now most people don't think about this, but buildings are just like working with wood. They move over time. So you wanna make sure that any time you have a corner coming together, you glue that corner so that it's held together with some wood glue or epoxy or something. So as the building moves, those mitered corners don't start to open up. I was fortunate enough that my office space is small, so I only had to have one seam in my baseboard around the entire perimeter of the room. And I tried to hide that over closer to where it was gonna be behind the door just a little bit. Whenever you do a seam in baseboard, you wanna cut both pieces at a 45 and overlap them and then sand it nice and smooth. Don't just butt the pieces up against each other. You're not gonna have a smooth seam. 
With all of my baseboard installed, it was time to start figuring out my panels. Now, like I said, this is gonna be a board and batten, which means I'm gonna put quarter inch MDF panels on the wall, and then I'm gonna have these vertical battens running from the baseboard up to a top trim piece. So it's important that as you're measuring to put your quarter inch panel on the wall, you figure out exactly where you want your seams so that you know those seams will be covered with a batten. I knew I was going to have a batten centered under each window, so I decided to start with the windowed wall because it was going to be a little more complicated, but more importantly I already knew exactly where my seams were going to land. So with all my measurements, I headed over to my shop, pulled out my track saw, and started cutting down some MDF. Well, I would have if I actually had batteries in my saw. Jeez. So with batteries in my saw, I just laid the track down on top of some MDF and started slicing that stuff up into the right size pieces. The first piece of MDF to go on the wall is going to be the most complicated because I have to cut around the existing built-ins. Now yes, it would have been easier had I done the decorative casing before I put the built-ins in, but I didn't. I didn't have the idea until after they were all installed, so we have to cut around it. So I very carefully marked out exactly the shape of the built-in onto my quarter inch MDF so that I could cut out that shape to have the MDF fit perfectly around the built-in. The foreman came out in his pajamas to check on my work, which I thought was very unprofessional. Once I knew exactly what material I had to remove so that my piece would fit around those built-ins, I just kind of scribbled on it a little bit so I knew what had to come off and then I cut as much as I could with a track saw so I could get a nice straight line. After I did the majority of the work with the track saw, I just cleaned it up with the jigsaw, trying to stay as tight to my line as I possibly could. And if all my measurements were correct, this piece should perfectly fit around that built-in and oak countertop. As you can see, you just slide it into the top of that quarter inch rabbit we already cut on the trim, slide it over, booyah! perfect fit. And I have a nice clean seam at the bottom and a good transition from my baseboard to that quarter inch MDF. Next we need to mark out for our outlets. Now I'm not going to actually cut these out. I'm just going to mark on the MDF where they are and I'll come back and cut them out later with a flush trim bit on the router. You'll see what I mean. It's probably the most satisfying part of this entire project. So with my outlets and switches marked out, I make sure to push the wires deep in those boxes so that I don't have any risk of hitting them with the router. And we're ready to start adhering our panels to the wall. To do this, I'm gonna use just a 16 gauge brad nailer, but for a little extra oomph, I'm also gonna use some squirts of liquid nails. This is just gonna make sure that our panel doesn't bow over time and stays nice and flat and very secure to the wall. You don't need a ton of liquid nails, just a nice little loop-de-loop -loop pattern and you stick it up there. On this first piece, I made a little mistake, which you'll see here in just a second. And that's the fact that I added liquid nails where we're gonna cut out for the window. <laughs> so silly. I got liquid nails all over that piece of wood and I didn't need it. Anyways, I just locate all my studs and start tacking it in with a few 16 gauge brad nails. The other nice thing about the liquid nails is you don't need as many brad nails. Just a few to hold it in place until that liquid nails dries. If you want to make it really easy on yourself, you could draw a line on your quarter inch MDF knowing exactly where your studs are which I didn't do, I just kinda stepped back and eyeballed it. And then I measured from that panel over to the seam for my next window so that I could cut that quarter inch panel the length and have another seam that lines up perfectly under the next window. So back to the shop to cut down a quarter inch piece of MDF and then I slid it in there just to make sure it lined up exactly where I wanted it to. And of course, also making sure to mark my outlets on the piece. You don't wanna to forget to mark an outlet or you'll kick yourself later. It's probably a good idea to take a picture of the wall before you start so that you can double check afterwards and make sure you got all the outlets. And if you missed one, you'll kinda of know where it is based on the picture that you took at the beginning. So, after being happy with the fit of my second panel, I squirted a whole bunch more liquid nails in the back. 
this time tracing out where my windows are going to be so I didn't put liquid nails where I didn't need it, you know, and just make a sticky mess. Then it was just moving on with the same process we did on that first panel. Slide it in that quarter inch rabbit on the top of my trim, make sure it's nice and tight against my first piece, and tack it in place with my 16 gauge brad nailer. You just want to make sure not to send nails through into that open window space. I mean, it's not going to really hurt anything. It's just going to make you feel kind of like a doofus. After I got a little practice on those first few panels, I started to fly through this. I mean, I had a little system down. I'd measure, I'd cut with the track saw, squirt my liquid nails on there, and slide everything in place. This really isn't that difficult of a project to do, and I'm pretty sure anybody can do it. You just gotta take time and make sure you go through the right steps. Now you might also be wondering about those windows and why I'm just covering them up with that quarter inch ply. Because I will come back with a flush trim router and cut all those perfectly, which in my mind is way easier to do than trying to measure every panel and make sure you land it right around the windows. You'll see, trust me. Pretty soon I had my entire wall covered with my quarter inch MDF. Now I decided to do this wall completely before I moved on to the other walls. That way I could figure out the spacing on my battens, have one wall to kind of use as a reference, and then match all the other walls to that first wall. And I started with the windowed wall because I knew it would be the hardest and most complicated, which meant the other walls were just going to be super easy. Now that I had all that quarter inch paneling on the wall, it was finally time to cut out for all my outlets and windows. So. I just used a Forzner bit to drill into where all my outlet boxes were, and then using a flush trim bit on my router, from Bits and Bits, of course, coupon code in the video description, I just zip zap zooped around each window until I had them cut out flawlessly. Didn't I say that was satisfying? I mean, super fun. And Craig, because he's such a nice guy, held the vacuum cleaner hose while I did this because MDF is disgusting and makes a horrible mess. But it paints really well and is perfect for trim in a space like this that's not gonna have any contact with moisture. So we just worked our way along, cutting window after window and vacuuming up the dust as we went. And pretty soon our project was looking much more refined. Hey, what's up? This video is sponsored by Suizan Saws. Now every once in a while we get a sponsor for a video that is just incredibly easy to promote because it's a product I know, a product that I love, and in this case a product that I pretty much use exclusively. Whenever I'm using a handsaw, you've seen it in YouTube videos, I'm always grabbing one of Suizan's Japanese pole saws. This is their Ryoba saw, it's double sided, I use this one all the flipping time. Really thin kerf so you get a nice accurate cut, super sharp so it requires way less power to pull through your cuts. This thing is crazy flexible so it's perfect for flush cutting dowels or just trimming off just a hair and you don't have to have a ton of skill to make one of these saws work great. You can check out Suizan's YouTube channel. They got a bunch of videos on how to accurately use their saws to get the best results. I'm telling you guys, get a couple of these saws. They're not that expensive. And the nice thing is the handle's really large so they're easy to wield and you can replace just the blade. So if you get nicks or dings in your blade, you just get a new blade, switch it out. You can keep the same handle. You've seen me use them before. I've used them to build a boat. I've used them to build furniture. I mean, you look back in any of my videos, at some point I'm probably grabbing one of these saws and using it for countless different reasons. So go check out the link in the video description, get yourself a couple of these saws, and then let me know what you think. I know the answer. I know you're gonna say, wow, these saws are amazing. I love them. So you'll see, me. I mean, they're hanging all over in my shop. I kind of lay them all over the place so that whenever I need one, I can just, grab one and the added bonus is it's nice and flexible you could use this as a spatula flip some burgers something like that I mean it's probably not recommended use it to cut wood bottom line Suizan saws they're awesome they're great check them out pick one up you're gonna love it with all of our quarter inch paneling up on the walls, the next thing I needed to do was trim out the windows. Now the windows are drywalled on three sides, but they still need a little window sill on the bottom. 
So I just made some out of three quarter inch MDF with a little return on either side so it wrapped around the front of the window. This made it look pretty nice and clean and added another decorative element to the window casing itself. I just made sure it was a nice tight fit, plopped them in there, and then just nailed them down with a 16 gauge brad nailer. Now you're probably wondering, well what about that MDF just coming to an abrupt halt at the edge of the window? Aren't you going to do something with that? Of course I am. Calm the flip down. I just need to get all my window sills in place first, and then I will take care of making it look all finished and pretty. The first step in doing this is cutting some more MDF to go on the inside of the windows. Just a nice little strip. It doesn't have to be super pretty on the corner there where it meets the other MDF, but you do want it nice and tight against your window casing because that's gonna be a visible seam. Once you have your pieces fitting the way you want them, I just tack them in place with a 16 gauge nailer and move on to step two in beautifying this whole window situation. Step two is adding the top to our casing detail. And that's just a piece of five inch MDF trim, again with a quarter inch rabbit cut on the bottom this time. That'll sit on top of the quarter inch MDF and make a nice transition from our top rail onto our MDF paneling. You just wanna make sure that your pieces go on nice and level. Don't assume that just because they're sitting flush on the bottom of your trim that the top's gonna be level. Because if your floor's not level, well, then your top trim's not gonna be level. So just check as you go. I just mitered all my corners so they were nice and smooth and glued each one so that they'd stay that way over time. And again, just tacked everything in place with the 16 gauge. Yes, the holes are kind of big, but because this is gonna be painted, we can fill and sand everything smooth and you're never gonna know they were there. I just worked my way along the entire wall, going across the front of the wall and then diving into each window so that it gave it a nice wrapped look. Wrapped as in you wrap something up, not wrap as in Biggie and Tupac and straight out of Compton style. You, you guys know what I mean. I just yeah, I wrapped the top with primed MDF trim. This wall was by far the most complicated because I had so many pieces to deal with. But just go slow and really take your time to make sure that all those corners are as perfect as you can get them. You're going to appreciate it later when you're staring at it and don't see a big open gap full of caulking. Nobody wants that. Then the final step in cleaning up our windows is taking some of this corner trim that you can pick up at any big box store and just cutting a piece to cover up that exposed transition from the wall to the inside of the window. I just cut it so it's a nice tight fit and wedge it in place. This is big enough that it covers up both pieces of that quarter inch paneling and once it's painted, it'll look like you're professional. Even though you just bought some little pieces of corner trim at Home Depot, but nobody needs to know that. Once you're satisfied with the fit, this time I switched to an 18 gauge brad nailer just so I had smaller holes to deal with, and I just worked my way along until I had trim pieces in all of my windows. And with that, we were almost done. Just need to add some battens. Now you can use anything you want for battens. Strips of wood, strips of MDF, I just picked up these pre-primed Craftsman door and trim pieces at Home Depot. They're a good size, they're a good shape, and they should fit in between my two trim pieces with the greatest of ease. Now the first thing you wanna do is cover up your seams because those are places you know you're gonna want battens. And like I said, I made sure to center one under each window. Now let me tell you a secret about decorative casing and adding battens don't try and get your battens all even. If you go into anyone's house and you pull out a tape measure and you measure the distance between their battens, I guarantee they're not evenly spaced because it never works out to evenly space them and have everything centered under windows and look right. The most important thing is that you land battens in the places that are really gonna draw your eye. For example, those battens under the windows. If those were off center to the left or right because I was trying to get all my battens evenly spaced, 
you would pick it out immediately the second you walked in. But since those are centered, I can just kind of fill battens in everywhere else where it seems natural. I mean, when you saw the clip at the beginning of the video with everything painted, did you even realize that all the spacing between those battens was completely different? No, because your eye doesn't pick up on that. After landing the battens dead under the window, the next thing I tried to do was have even spacing from the edge of the window to the battens on either side of the window. After that, you just kind of make things work where they land. Another thing you want to try and avoid is landing a batten over an outlet. I've seen people cut out notches to go around outlets, and that is a huge eyesore, and you don't want that. So try and land the battens to the left or right of an outlet with enough room left over that you can still get the outlet cover on. And when you look at this entire wall in a second, try and remember that you only know the spacing is off because I told you. Sure, you'll probably comment down below that you noticed right away but you're lying to yourself and everybody else on YouTube. You had no clue, because it looks great. I know it's hard as a woodworker not to get everything evenly spaced, because every other time you build something, that's what you want to do. But it's just not going to work out that way on a wall with windows and outlets and everything else. Just get them as even as you can, make sure you don't have any huge thing that draws the eye, and once it's painted, unless you point it out, nobody will ever notice. And with that, I had one wall entirely complete. Now that that wall was done, which was the most difficult wall, and I somewhat knew the spacing of my battens, I could go around and do the rest of the walls in exactly the same way, and just try and land the battens as evenly spaced as I could on the other walls, so that the spacing somewhat matched that first wall. Again, don't get too hung up on making sure they're absolutely perfect. Nobody's going to be able to tell. If somebody walks into your room and pulls out a tape measure, tell them to get the heck out of your house and never talk to you again. Because you don't want to be friends with that kind of person. I'm talking to you, Keith Johnson. All in all, this was a pretty quick project. And in my opinion, it really dressed up the space. So it was totally worth the effort. I did this entire decorative casing in just a single day. Now that doesn't include painting time, which if you're gonna paint yourself, you gotta figure that in as well. As far as cost goes, I think I spent less than $700 on all the material for this one pretty large room. It's all MDF, it goes up easily, and it paints great. And the fun thing about casing like this is the options are unlimited. You can really do whatever you want. I did this classic board and batten style, but you can do cool shapes or crosses or X's or circles or fishes or, I mean, anything you wanna do. Just be you. And there's a few other things I should probably mention. Because you're adding a quarter inch of material to the wall, you're gonna to wanna to bump out your outlets a quarter of an inch to be flush with that new surface. But this can easily be done just by getting some quarter inch gang boxes and slapping them on your existing outlet boxes. They literally just go right on the front and you move your outlet forward. And just like I did, you definitely wanna start with your hardest wall first because that's the one that you're gonna figure all your spacing of your battens out. And by the time you get done with that, the rest of the walls, well, they're just gonna fly by. I did get to this one corner and decided the best look for this was to miter two pieces together. So I just ran them through the table saw at a 45 degree angle and glued and taped them and then finally tacked them in place with a 16 gauge brad nailer. Once you have all your trim and paneling and battens up, the last thing you're gonna wanna do is go through and fill all your nail holes and caulk any of your seams. And then paint it. Or, in my case, hire a professional to come in and paint it. Because painting sucks and nobody should be doing it. Except the highly paid professional painters. And that's why they're highly paid. Because even they don't want to do it. It was getting dark by the time I finished, but I managed to get the entire space covered in that decorative casing in just one day. Sure, I was tired and hot and sweaty but it was worth it because it looked fantastic.
I mean, just imagine that these walls were just drywalled. That wouldn't look cool. You gotta admit, this decorative casing really jazzes up the joint. And as you can see in the video, it's not that difficult to make a really cool effect and look in any space. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Check out the video description for links to a bunch of different products that I used. There's a link to our Patreon page where you can sign up to get a whole bunch of behind the scenes footage and backstage pass access, bunch of other perks. And, was there an and? I completely lost my train of thought. And, oh, subscribe. That was it. And subscribe. Every time I forget that.